Hello, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Uh, my name is Martin Lovers. I'm the Chief Trend Watcher of Supply Chain Media. You may also know me as the Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Movement, European Quarterly Magazine, and also website and bi-weekly newsletter. Um, and I'm also the architect of the SCM IT Subway Map with uh, the representation of all the supply chain uh, software vendors uh, in Europe, uh, among them also Project 44. And I'm also the initiator of the European Supply Chain Startup and Scale-Up Contest. Uh, and Trex as a, a Scale-Up uh, will be also involved. Uh, so welcome to this webinar, a live webinar um, about an important uh, topic. Uh, we will discuss the road to decarbonization, but to make it more practical, how to make transportation sustainably, uh, sustainable quickly. That's what you're going to discuss, and uh, you will have these practical answers. So uh, with me, oh, wait up. Uh, you see me here on the left and the side. You have seen my picture probably before. But next to me, I have uh, Christian Piller. He's a VP Research and Sustainability at uh, Project 44. And before this, you know, you have also worked at Amazon since uh, uh, until 2019. So that's good to know. So uh, Christian, welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. All right, and next to uh, Christian, I have uh, another expert in this matter, Jacob uh, Moose, uh, founder and CEO of Trex. So, uh, Jacob, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and also, uh, Jacob, uh, I saw that uh, before you uh, started uh, uh, Trex, you were working at Volkswagen as a futurist and a trend forecaster. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I was. Yeah. So, uh, could you explain briefly what you did? You know, uh, you know, you know, uh, what is kind of job is that? Yeah, I mean, I um, I worked in different positions uh, with this role. First in uh, the Volkswagen Group Research, mm -hmm. and later at Volkswagen Financial Services. It started being more um, an innovation role where we looked into, uh, we used. Um, we used uh, customer research. We were very much thinking along the lines of uh, design thinking in order to try to look into the future and say, what will customers need when we create product service systems? Uh, later, when I switched to Volkswagen Financial Services, it became more in the strategy department. It was more focused on strategic forecasting. But basically, we're trying to, to make some future scenarios and say, if this is going to happen, what do we need to do in order to make it happen? One of my favorite examples was uh, when we said in the future all cars will pay automatically for parking what will we need to do today in order to get this going and then we started building up bilateral agreement uh, with, with park uh, space owners and so on and so forth so it was very interesting it was very a, a very nice job all right hey, good to know you know and we can talk about it a lot that you know we'll uh focus on uh you know uh, uh, sustainable uh, transportation all right um this webinar will be recorded and the PDF will be made available afterwards uh, within 48 hours. Uh, you can enlarge your screen by clicking on the four small arrows on the upper right side. So that's uh, something you can do to enlarge your screens. We have put off the camera. We are live here, but you know, we've seen a lot of faces uh, in the last two years with all kind of Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams meetings. All right. Um, you can ask questions along the line. The discussion I will be having with Christian and uh, Jacob. Um, so please use uh, the Q&A function with AirMeet. You see it on the right-hand side. Uh, there's a chat function, but please use the Q&A because if there are a lot of questions, uh, I can see what's, which one has uh, the most uh, votes. Um, so you can ask these questions right away. And if these questions are in line of the conversation we will be having, I will ask these questions right away. There is also a Q&A at the end. So uh, feel free also uh, to, uh, to ask your questions over there. Um, and next to that, after 5 o'clock CET, we'll be setting down in a lounge. So there will be a, a 30 minutes after talk, so you can have a direct conversation with Christian and Jacob and myself uh, in the lounge. Uh, we'll be sitting at uh, table one. So uh, feel free to join us also afterwards, but uh, not necessarily. So, uh, you know, uh, we have a further conversation over there. All right. Um, two years ago, Supply Chain Media did a, a survey about the investments uh, in supply chain, we ask uh, 106 manufacturing wholesale retail companies and manufacturing companies about their uh, investments in the next uh, 18 months. Uh, and it was just after the first wave of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. And basically, uh, you see it here, uh, system operations planning is number one, but uh, surprise, surprise, end-to-end -end supply chain visibility is number two. And um, we also distinguished 
about uh, the, the maturity of uh, the companies. So you, in blue, you see the overall companies and in orange, you see the more mature companies. So on a Gartner scale from one to five, um, the four or five uh, level companies are more mature and you see different kind of investment plans. So end-to-end -end supply chain visibility is number one uh, among the more mature companies and lower down also real-time transport visibility is scoring high. And, uh, you know, uh, being from Project 44, I was wondering, Christian, do you recognize this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this overview and especially about the visibility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we track and it's actually something that we've seen come true over the past two years, because I think visibility is important, is an important foundational layer for a lot of these other initiatives. And what's exciting to see is that the more mature companies score higher on supply chain visibility and real-time visibility because I think they understand that the high fidelity data is necessary to make more effective decisions. And that high fidelity data also feeds some of these other tools to make them run more efficiently. So I'm looking between end-to-end -end supply chain visibility and real-time transport visibility and seeing supply chain network design. Yep. And more mature companies are higher on that um, and I think that's because they're connecting the dots and saying, yep, it's really important that we have this high fidelity data and we're moving away from assumptions, averages and pads that are, are sometimes prevalent if we use email and spreadsheets and legacy technology. Yeah. And also supply chain risk management is also a new kind of flavor. Also looking at uh, news feeds and looking up to your supply uh, uh, side in the tier two, tier three, what's happening over there? Are there disruption uh, over there? Of course, we know uh, ports, uh, lockdowns in Shanghai at the moment right now, that kind of stuff. But if you drill deeper, there are, might be fires or, or uh, strikes somewhere uh, upstream uh, you might not be aware of. And you see also the more mature uh, companies are investing in this kind of supply chain risk management. So also in qualitative data, you see more investment in that uh, kind of visibility that's also related to that. Um, all right. And um, this year we will repeat this survey for one thing. And another thing is we also, next to this kind of supply chain types, we also uh, include uh, sustainability for supply chain as software uh, into the next IT subway map. So the likes of tracks will be also included in the upcoming version of our SEM IT subway map uh, for one thing. And also we will include uh, supply chain software for sustainability as a separate uh, category, I would say next to the ERP, WMS, and you name it. So that uh, will be uh, among uh, the upcoming uh, research we are doing. All right, uh, Christian, in, you know, let's talk about the major topics we, uh, about sustainability. What, what would you uh, see as the major topics to address and decarbonization of uh, the supply chain? Yeah, I, I think what's most important for, for Jakob and I um, and our, our mutual customers now and in the future is one, it, it's really scope three emissions. Uh, so for those of you that are familiar with, with uh, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, uh, your supply chain is in scope three, and there's really no way to effectively measure what's happening in that space now in, until uh, joint solutions like Project 44 and Trax. Uh, but supply chain could be up to 60% of your total carbon emissions. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Jakob is much more of an expert in emissions framework than I am, uh, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. There's so many different frameworks. Um, Jakob has kind of the inside track on, on the future of what the frameworks will look like. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk a, a lot about the quality of data, the power of, of modeling data and primary data and getting away from uh, really assumptions, averages and pads. So I brought it up previously with visibility. Same thing applies to emissions, uh, specifically scope three emissions. Um, and then we'll talk about some journeys to reduce scope three emissions, um, whether it be um, just through the, the power of data uh, or different workflows. Yeah. Talking about data, you know, um, a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, data is the new oil. And I always say, you know, yeah, but it's, it's crude oil. You have to refine it. And uh, but, but, you know, then again, uh, do we measure enough? What do you think, Christian? I, I mean, there, there's more data coming every day. I agree with you that uh, data is the new oil. I love the, the add-on that it's the crude oil and needs to be refined. Definitely important. Um, 
one of the challenges with scope three data specifically for supply chain emissions data is right now there's no single source of truth it's inaccessible it's inaccurate um, and that really means you can't fix what you can't measure uh, so that's the the topic of the first few slides in, in conversation with Jakob and I yeah and and, and I've, for the division definition sake scope one and scope two is uh, the carbon uh, uh, emission and energy consumption within your own warehouses within your own factories that's scope one and two and scope three is outside your asset your outside your where your own warehouses and your own factories yeah that's right scope three includes some other things but yeah it's, it's really your supply chain so all of your global transportation partners your your ocean carriers your your truckload providers anywhere in the world that's really in scope three um and Scope three can be up to 90%, obviously includes some other things, but inside of that, um, yeah, th this is the slide we were looking for. So scope one and two is the facilities and company owned assets. Uh, your buildings, whether it be a storefront, a manufacturing facility, a distribution center, uh, company owned uh, trucks, uh, mm -hmm. company owned airplanes, if you're a transport provider. Scope two being electricity um, to power your, your electricity and water, other utilities to power your, distribution centers or, or cool your server farm. Everything else is, is really scope three. It includes freight transport, purchased goods, business travel, waste, and, and some other goods. So um, a lot of focus uh, certainly that we see in the market is on scope one and two. And yep. there's a lot of opportunity in that 90%, which is what uh, Jakob and I are, are trying to solve for. Yeah. Um... And of course, if you have your own transportation, you, you have better control on the, the transportation assets. But a lot of companies, most companies, you know, uh, they have outsourced the actual transportation to carriers. So uh, basically, they don't don't have real control uh, about these assets. Um, and another thing is uh, in Europe, you know, uh, since uh, last fall, the EU in Brussels have uh, uh, dictated that as of next year, uh, uh, 2023, the publicly traded companies should um, uh, have improvements, quarterly improvements uh, on their e ESG and especially scope three uh, uh, goals. And but and that, so basically they have to measure scope three. Uh, otherwise, the, the 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 consultants of Deloitte or the accounts of Deloitte, PwC, EY, and you name them, cannot uh, audit these companies. So basically, the publicly traded company as of next year. They have to show measurements and improvement. Otherwise, the auditors cannot assess them and they cannot report to uh, uh, the financial analysts, basically. So that, that's a driver. Um, I was wondering, Christian, how is that in the U.S.? Because that is in uh, uh, EU, uh, EU uh, regulations uh, since recently. How is it in the U.S.? Uh, maybe two or three weeks back, the Security and Exchange Commission came out with uh, an announcement and, and some lightweight guidance that was saying in the future, the SEC is going to expect publicly traded companies to include uh, scope one, scope two and scope three emissions in their financial reporting. Uh, as of right now, it's a little light on, on detail, mechanics, uh, potential cost of, of a metric ton of carbon, uh, but it is coming. I think that the US is a few years behind Europe. Europe is much more progressive here and has made a lot more progress um, on uh, emissions as a whole, scope one, scope two, and scope three, mm -hmm. uh, but it is coming. And then, you know, there's some other regulations just like in Europe where some countries have something more specific. Um, California tends to be a more progressive state in the US and, and they have some specific controls um, or regulations um, in counties or cities uh, that are asking their shippers to understand how much emissions their trucks are um, emitting while waiting to get into a distribution center, as an example. So it is absolutely coming. Um, I think the cost of doing nothing is only going to increase. So that's why it's important to get started now. And I know that's something that, that Jakob and I will, will talk about later, but it, it's coming, uh, even in the U.S. And if you are zooming into the supply chain and companies, how uh, do these figures relate to what you expressed earlier? Yeah, so this is another view of the, of the same problem, right? So if you, you add the 60% from supply chain and the 30% of other assets or other emissions from assets you don't know, that's scope three, 90%. Up to 7% yeah. of a company's supply chain 
or up to 70% of a company's scope three emissions is supply chain. So that's how we got to the 60%. Yeah. Now we've talked to more than five dozen customers. We've talked to consultants, we've talked to other industry experts, and this is generally true. I have come across uh, maybe three to five customers where this is different, but it's different because their scope one is so huge, just given the uh, high intensity um, carbon intensive manufacturing processes that are inherent in the processes they make. Um, what's interesting is they know that and they're focused on that scope one problem. But for everyone else, um, where scope one is only 10% of their total emissions, they really need to start focusing outside of scope one and start getting into their supply chain just because it makes up such a huge percent of their overall carbon emissions. Yeah, that makes totally sense. So we have to uh, uh, look into our suppliers, our subcontractors and our distribu distribution network to see, okay, where are the emissions in the total supply chain? If you are looking right, right now and into the future, how do these uh, uh, transportation fight emission uh, develop? Yeah, so this is, this is a, a graphic that's talking about the, the expected increase of transportation freight emissions uh, through 2050. And this is if nobody does anything. And it's yeah. going to get worse or it, there's going to be more emissions, mainly because more people are buying more things, right? The, the, the pandemics taught us uh, a new terms like the homebody economy, where yeah. everyone is getting everything delivered to them. Uh, last mile tends to be uh, the most expensive mile for a shipper, but it's also one of the dirtiest per mile just because, or per kilometer, just because of all the stops that they're making and in the, in the, they're in cities and the, the fuel efficiency is very, very low. And uh, to drive all that, you know, there's, there's more uh, truckload shipments between suppliers and distribution centers. There's more ocean freight uh, from overseas suppliers uh, to Europe, from overseas suppliers to the U.S., and with port congestion that you mentioned earlier, they're waiting longer. There's just a lot of inefficiencies in growing uh, transportation demand. So if we do nothing, uh, it will get worse. So that's why we need to start right now and not wait for um, alternative propulsion vessels. There's a lot we can do right now. And as those other technologies uh, come online, autonomous trucks, biofuels, uh, hydro powered ships, uh, and similar will be even better off. But waiting for those technologies to be, you know, widely available and commercially viable at scale, um, we just can't afford to wait. No, and it, 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 this is, it's a generic uh, uh, graph, but uh, in a sense, it it gives an, uh, a better feeling of um, well, um, the differentiation between rail, air, and ocean and road freight, and that's that's good to uh, to know, you know. And now later on, we discuss how to. Uh, decarbonize uh, these uh, uh, emissions. Um, you already mentioned it, uh, we, uh, we discussed it briefly, you know, uh, data is very important, but can you uh, tell me a bit more what kind of data and especially about the data quality? Yeah, so I'll start off here and then I'm gonna tag Jakob in here because he's he's got uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of knowledge on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the left-hand side is default factors, which is really what the majority of shippers are using for their scope three emissions. It's an average length of haul. It's an average uh, weight per shipment to get ton miles or ton kilometers. And then multiplying that by some generic high level emissions factor for the mode, uh, whether it be an airplane, ocean, and that comes up with uh, metric tons of carbon. Um, that's a good place to start, but it's not accurate enough to drive any decisions. They're really high level averages. It's not at a shipment level. Uh, so the industry needs to get on the right hand side where it's uh, modeled or, or primary. Um, and it's much more accurate to what's actually happening at a shipment level. Uh, so companies can start to make more thoughtful decisions on what's happening with a particular carrier on a particular lane within a particular mode, country of import, country of export. It's extremely important to have this data to make more efficient decisions now. Um, so the, the journey to get from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is extremely difficult, which is one of the things we talked about at the top is supply chain emissions data is inaccessible and in inaccurate. Um, and you can't really measure, you can't fix what you can't measure. 
which is, uh, you know, Jakob and I were in Amsterdam uh, two weeks back together talking about this very topic of conversation. So I do want to, uh, you know, get Jakob's thoughts here um, because it's just the data quality is so important. Um, it's just, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jakob, you, you, you have a lot more insights here, but it's just extremely important. Yes, definitely. I mean, um, you said it uh, uh, perfectly. Uh, how do you want to manage something when you have, uh, or how do you want to take strategic decisions when you have 400% error rate? So that's one of the, the biggest points. The first thing our customers always see is uh, after they've realized, yes, they can measure with default factors just per ton kilometer, but that they, the first thing they realize is that they over calculate because they need to calculate very uh, conservatively. I calculate that the uh, vehicle went home empty or that we had, um, uh, that we drove in the city, and that's why we have this 400% overcalculation. Mm -hmm. So one thing is that you overcalculate your CO2 uh, pressure, but the second thing is that they realize is, oh, and if we calculate per ton kilometer, there's absolutely no lever to lower CO2. There's only ton kilometer and mode of transport, and that yeah. is uh, not enough to make any clever decisions on anything. So, um, so data quality is is really extremely important. If you want to decarbonize. If you want to uh, come to a point where your transport operations are at a zero, then you need um, you need to start measuring, of course, with default data. But you need to do everything you can to come uh, to the right of the screen and come to the primary points. I, I was wondering, Christian, and then I get back to uh, to Jakob. Um, you know, Project Forty Four. You know, you, you you deliver real time transport visibility, and you are able to do that because you get a lot of data from carriers and logistics service providers. So you are already in this area where you, you know, uh, receive data and make it available to to shippers, uh, so uh, uh, brand manufacturers, retailers, and such. So you're already in that field of gathering data from logistics service providers and carriers. Yeah, that's right. So very similar to how we built um, our real-time visibility network with that high fidelity data uh, mm -hmm. for transport visibility and and. We'll follow a similar journey for scope three emissions data for sustainability data um, and build it mode by mode, geography by geography with valuable partners um, like Trax. The, the one thing um, that's like kind of a nice anecdote here, if you think about your transportation management system as an engine, this high fidelity data is the higher octane fuel or petrol that makes it run more efficiently. So uh, very similar to having that real time visibility data where you know exactly where that truck is. Is it running late? Is it on time? When did it actually arrive? Proactive notifications, et cetera. Uh, this data, this solution, this partnership um, is going to offer very, very similar insights uh, based on emissions, which is really important when you think about fundamentally reducing scope three emissions for global shippers. I get some questions now uh, coming in uh, and uh, keep on uh, sending out in this question. Uh, one question, how do we uh, create incentives for data sharing and, and uh, how do we make sure that we reward emission reductions by LSPs? Maybe Christian, how, how do we incentivize sharing of data by LSPs? Yeah, so I mean, there's, LSPs wanna help. I mean, in just as, just as shippers want to do better, LSPs also want to help. I think carriers and LSPs have been in the sustainability quote unquote game for a while, just because fuel makes up such a high percent of their operating costs that any increase in fuel efficiency is going to be good for them. Uh, so they've been trying for a while. Uh, one of the challenges that I think carriers have always had is that they're really they have to connect any shipper a with any constant e b and that can be very difficult if there are inefficiencies um, from the shipper side inefficiencies from the constant e side all those inefficiencies kind of sit on top of the carrier and it's the carrier's problem to solve that so one of the things i've seen so far in supply chain sustainability the community is really open to sharing and collaborating and really trying to help and i think any person at any company I've talked to realizes that no one company can solve this problem on their own. So we really, really need to collaborate uh, like Project 44 and Trax, uh, like Trax and their other their other partners and our mutual uh, customers now and in the future, whether that be a shipper or an LSP, just because 
the supply chain industry as a whole has to come together to solve this problem. Yeah, all right. Um, there's a more question, but keep on asking them, you know, but to uh, to go through the slides, so we don't have that many slides, but uh, enough to, to, to discuss. Uh, Jacob, Jacob, uh, or Jacob uh, could you explain about the setup of cracks, what you're doing, and also uh, the setup of uh, GL GLAC uh, framework? Definitely. So we at Tracks, we have um, uh, set up a system. We started in 2019 to set up a system where we would um, enable the the data sharing between carriers and shippers, mm -hmm. or rather just um, make make the the data infrastructure or the yeah it just make the data sharing easier between carriers and shippers. We started our system only focusing on road freight. That had to do, of course, with my background in. Uh, in automotive uh, and my knowledge about um, the data from uh, from from trucks and from vehicles and also uh, with our data team who are extremely good at working with uh, automotive data um, but we have uh, since then expanded it to all five modes of transport and what we do is we basically enable the shipper an automated measurement of co2 or rather allocation of co2 um, down on a shipment level uh, and uh, we always make sure that we use the best data possible. So if we know nothing about the truck, we will go on the default that we saw, saw on the slide before. But every time we just know something about the vehicle, for instance, uh, we know it was uh, a 40 ton truck, then we can put another uh, put another rules-based uh, lowering of CO2 on it. And if we know a little bit about the truck, uh, the vehicle owner, for instance, the fleet owner, or even the truck itself, we can model because we have built uh, uh, AI models that can sort of go in and uh, and yeah and make uh, and make uh, clever assumptions about uh, fill like uh, like fill rate in the truck and so on and so forth. And then in the in the in the perfect um, in the perfect example, we have all the vehicle data, like all the consumption data from the whole truck and from the whole trip. And then we know everything that was on board the truck so that we can allocate on uh, on the shipment level down to the the shipper so what we what we what we sell to the shipper and shipper we uh, we define very broadly so it is both um lsps and and classical shippers um what we sell is an automated and precise allocation on a shipment level uh, of co2 where we always guarantee that we use the best possible data and we're always accredited and that brings me here to the GLEC framework that you asked about mm -hmm. um, the GLEC framework, it was uh, it's, it stems from Smart Freight Center, uh, who sits in Amsterdam, and they in in twenty, I can't remember exactly which year, but the, but but five four years ago, decided to go in and and gather all the seventeen different standards that are out there mm -hmm. in how to measure a CO two or rather how to to do a CO two uh, accounting. That uh, you said it before, Price Waterhouse Coopers or uh, Ernst and Young will also put a stamp on. And since then, the GLEC framework has become the gold standard in CO2 accounting. In November, it's going to become the ISO standard because there was never an international standard and it's going to take over the current European norm uh, to become the one and only standard on how you measure CO2. And that brings me to the last point of it. The people often ask me, why do you need to have a standard of it? And of course, it's a little bit like in the 50s when we started building accounting standards uh, uh, in the normal accounting we have today. There were five different standards they needed to find out how do we agree on how long time we uh, we off, uh, off uh, write off at uh, uh, an office table, for instance, or an office chair. Yep. And going in and finding a consensus of it is extremely important. And that landed in the 50s with normal accounting. And right now it has landed uh, here with the ISO standard in, in, in 2022. We have come to a point where we are all agreed on how we do the precise allocation and the fairest allocation of CO2 between the shipper and the carrier. And, you know, finally, quite remarkable that the shippers, so, so the brand owners, the owner of the goods, can save 50 to 80 percent reported CO2 simply by enhancing the quality of their emissions data. Can you explain? Yes, it, it goes back to the slide we had before. And I always I, I have a good example. Um, it is, of course, in an extreme like not not in all cases with full truck load it's often less mm -hmm. but i will say one example we have one euro pallet that goes from a to b and uh we only know uh starting point and end point so we have kilometers we know the weight is one ton and we know um 
the mode, it's road. But we don't know anything else. So that's everything the shipper has in his shipment, his uh, shipper system. According to the GLEC framework, we need to take the worst for granted. And one ton Euro pallet can be on board a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. Mm -hmm. And that would be uh, over 600, maybe 600, uh, 650 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer. So we would put it on board a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. We would take for granted that he drives through the city and that he drives home empty. But... In the second we start measuring, we find out, oh, it was on a on board a 40-ton truck together with all other things. Mm -hmm. And the truck yeah. only drove on the highway and it also drove home uh, full. And we we often see in these cases that the CO2 per ton kilometer goes down between 52 and 60, 64 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer, depending on how full the how the fill rate was and how uh, how well the driver drove, and of course the route. Okay. Quite interesting. You know, um, uh, you know, there are. Let's talk about uh, reduction strategies because we have different uh, modes. So, what can we do? Yes, I mean, this is uh, where Christian said it so well before. Uh, how do you want to manage what you can't measure? And this was my example. When you do a default, you have uh, mode and uh, uh, weight and kilometers, and <laughs> and the only thing you can do is to say, okay, I'll I'll stop. You don't want to drive less. So you want to find a way to 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 get away from the to change the mode, so to speak. Uh, stop flying, get uh, what's on the road, on the train, and so on. But everyone who works in transport knows that this is uh, this is uh, easy to just make some arrows because it won't work. It, it, this is not helping. It can't be operationalized like this. So on the next slide, you see um, an example where we see mod we've seen different strategies with model data. With model data, it's you 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 measure different uh, or or further uh, levers uh, mm -hmm. that or further things that you can use as levers. I here put uh, intermodality because it is an extremely important factor. I'm not neglecting it at all. I'm just saying it, you need better data in order to make these decisions. The second one is um, that you can start buying different um, alternative fuels. Then we talk about fill rate, and then we talk about how we can work together with the cleanest um, the cleanest uh, subcontractor. So we do see some companies who have started to use this model data to make some decisions. But again, uh, the next one, you'll see that the gold standard when it comes to CO2 management is, uh, in the next slide, the 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 primary data because it gives you so many other things you can do you can make ai uh, algorithms what we have done by uh, at tracks uh, uh, the last three years to be able to measure uh, and make decision like on which route can i support my subcontractor either with driver courses uh, and what's the return of investment on this or actually how can i help like on which routes uh, is the driver clever enough and is the route uh, specific enough that I can have electric vehicles? Uh, you have partner management. You can start saying, okay, this partner uh, should actually drive a little bit better uh, compared to the fact that he drives on the highway and that he, like, why does he have such a, a high level of CO2 per ton kilometer? How can I help him get his trucks full or how can I uh, change the supplier? And then comes um, so like a, a, an overall supply chain strategy because it is an important point that we are doing at Trax, uh, both with, uh, with Project 44 and with other partners, that we help in the planning just with predictive analytics based on the data we have already going in and say, if you drive tomorrow in this weather with this driver and this truck, uh, on this route, you will have this CO2, and if you do this detour uh, to the train station, you can get um, you can get this uh, amount of CO2, so that you have an optimization point, a, a kind of a norm. So, the, the the beauty about primary data is that you get away from these 400% error rate, and you can actually start having data that you can make decisions on. I, I was wondering, you know, uh, there are some differences, uh, you know, and uh, if you look at the US and uh, and Europe, and uh, but I was wondering, there were some discussions and pilots in platooning i had a discussion with uh, some uh, uh transportation executives last week so they don't see platooning happening in europe it might be uh, happening in in, in us so jacob maybe uh, your point of view how do you measure or how do you uh, define uh, the carbon emissions for this kind of uh, 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 pilots like platooning and and, it, and and if it does make sense have you also figures about you know if it makes sense for decarbonization to do platooning. 
Yes, definitely. It's a very interesting question you're asking because this is sort of the core of, of the problem. This is the reason why we overcalculate CO2 and road freight so much. Um, the reason is that it's extremely difficult to calculate a total cost of operation. It's mm -hmm. easy to say this is the fuel I spent yesterday, but it's extremely difficult to say what do I expect of, of, of using a fuel tomorrow, uh, knowing the weather, knowing the load and so on and so forth. And this is one of the biggest challenges for platooning. It is that people say, yeah, you save, let's say, 7% or you, like, you save 14% on the front truck, 8% uh, of the, uh, the, the, the back truck and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. everyone can come and say, says who? And compared to what? Uh, what if the driver drives stupidly? And so on and so forth. It's very difficult to have this context-aware benchmark. So the, the core of what Trax is offering is one side the 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 descriptive analytics where we measure and say, this is the CO2 you spent yesterday on the shipment level and also on the truck level, if you're interested in that. But the most important part is that we go in and use a context aware a benchmark and say, this is what it could have had or should have had. And we use AI to do so, so that we can come in and actually answer the question that you just uh, asked, Martin, is if you go in and do platooning, what is the return of investment? Uh, what is the return of investment of high, um, of, um, of low rolling resistance tires? What is the return of investment of these skirts on this uh, new truck and so on and so forth? So you, you're totally right. I think the, the main problem has always been in the vehicle industry that it's extremely difficult to calculate uh, total cost of operations because fuel consumption is so, so difficult to predict. And we have found a way to do it. All right. And you, you mean ROI on a financial level, but also on probably on a carbon emission level? Yes, definitely. Uh, I see it as the same. I must also say that when I touch on CO2, I always see it as a new currency. I mean, there's okay. nothing for me. I just I just see another way. It's like one thing is dollar. One thing is euro. One thing is CO2. It is going to cost money. And we just I'm just talking uh, of another currency, so to speak. All right. Uh, uh, Christian, you know, uh, looking at the US, now, there are some pilots going on for driverless trucks, uh, especially along the highways of the U.S., long tracks and, uh, you know, that could make sense. And you have driverless trucks or you have driverless trucks with a driver in it for uh, the ramp off and the, the last mile and the first mile. How do you relate that kind of uh, uh, pilots also by Amazon and, some, and the likes in this, this uh, matter of decarbonization of uh, road transportation? So, I mean, road transportation specifically, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, it's probably the same thing in Europe, but um, drivers in the U.S. are only able to drive for a certain amount of time per day or within the 24 or 48 hour uh, time frame. Mm -hmm. So if a driver is able to drive for 11 hours a day, legally drive for 11 hours a day, that's behind the windshield driving down the road. Um, inefficiencies are really causing the drivers to only be driving for six and a half hours a day. What are they doing with that other period of time? Well, they're waiting in line to be loaded. They're waiting in traffic. They're waiting in line to be unloaded. Um, it's not the problem of the driver. It's the problem of the system. Jakob's point on carbon being a new new currency um, is uh, is a good one. And, and Jakob, just so you know now, I'm going to steal that in future conversations. But I will give you credit. Um, <laughs> is that it helps the it will help the carriers understand um, exactly where they're losing the most emissions and, and help them have those conversations with that shipper that's making them wait in line, with that consignee that's making them wait in line. It could also lead to improvements in, in routing decisions, uh, potentially moving around different, uh, different traffic patterns if you now contemplate cost versus performance versus emissions. Um, now, carriers can do that in, in one way with, with smarter routing decisions, um, or enhanced routing decisions rather, and working with their uh, shippers and consignees to try and reduce that wait time because now we're all using the same currency uh, and having a, a, an aligned conversation. Uh, but shippers can also do that by taking into account saying, wow, it, it takes my drivers four hours to get through my distribution center. That's unacceptable if we think about this from a sustainability perspective. Yeah. And also, you know, what we see in Europe, you know, uh, 30 percent. So 3.0, 30 percent of uh, 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 the transportation in Europe is empty. And uh, the overall uh, 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 fill rate of trucks is 50 percent. And, you know, that should be improved. And by having these kind of me measurements, uh, Jacob has uh, suggested, 
we we we, uh, we have to drive this down this this uh, empty uh, mileage and also we have to uh, you know uh, improve uh, the load factor of trucks so that's also something uh, of interest to see um Jakob, you know um uh, give an example uh, like this uh, could you mesh, uh, could you mention you know how to improve and where is the gain Yes, definitely. So the first thing that happens is that uh, our customers put on, um, they uh, onboard their uh, shipments and we start measuring. That's the first one you see. That's the CO2 footprint. Uh, it's just one example we have with one customer. Uh, the next one is that we get the easy wins. Those are when we start measuring CO2 uh, connected to the truck. In some cases, we only know the wind number. We can sort of like lower because we know it's not a three and a half ton truck. We know it's a 40 ton truck. In other cases, we get real primary data, and that gives us very quick, easy wins in measured CO2. And it's important for me, of course, to say measured CO2 because it's not real savings, but it enables us to make strategies. And that's the next one you see uh, in the red one is TBD. We sit with customers. We work with um, TMS providers um, to help putting strategies down for lowering CO2 through better planning. Mm -hmm. uh, both in procurement and in um, and in yeah, just in the in, in the daily dispatching. Again, using predictive analytics to say to use CO two as a norm side by side with um, with um, uh, service level and price. And when we then have come to the point where we lower CO two, either through the uh, the shipper shipment side or through the collaboration side where we help the carriers to lower CO two we can come to the offsetting point where we really just offset. Um, yeah, so this is our, um, uh, this is the way we do it with customers. We uh, have seen a huge success already. And also um, the happiness, of course, that the more trucks come on board, also external trucks that you just drive with on this, um, on the, uh, uh, like on a, on a irregular basis on the spot market, mm -hmm. then your CO2 footprint will become lower. And that's a, a huge advantage for tracks, of course. Yeah, and, and I got another question. Um, we all need to be rooting for each other. How do Project 44 and tracks think about the intersection of competition and collaboration? Of course, you know, among Project 44 and tracks, you have also competitors uh, delivering similar kind of solutions on one hand and also looking at the uh, 3pl companies like uh, dsv dhl etc so there's a lot of competition in your field in a transportation field how do you you know make sure that you you, you get you know get the, the most data and get the most out of it jacob you first uh, yes, definitely. I mean, what we do is we uh, we try to, uh, first of all, we have a very close cooperation with Project 44, which helps us in mm -hmm. both ways. So if we have a, a, a customer uh, who is not a shipper customer over Project 44, but drives with trucks that are registered over Project 44, we have a data sharing or data uh, procurement agreement that we can also measure the other way around. And then when Project 44 comes with the shipper and we have a truck on board that hasn't uh, onboarded its primary data with Project 44, Project 44 can also get access to the data on our platform. And we are uh, working on expanding this to other companies, not necessarily uh, real-time visibility providers, but other uh, uh, companies uh, who have uh, access to either shippers or carriers, because I think it's extremely important that we that we work together on this. I think the comment uh, from Danny Gomez was uh, was super correct. Everyone wins um, the more, the less we need to explain <laughs> explain people about the CO2 thing. Everyone wins if we have the ability to do these primary measurements. So, so yeah. yes, I can only agree. Yeah, and Christina, what's your view on this? Yeah, so I agree with what Jakob said on, on the, the data sharing. Like, you know, this is this is not something that's um, futuristic or being contemplated. Like a customer of Project 44 could do this now, right? Like you could start measuring emissions, uh, you know, with, with over the road in Europe with tracks in particular. Um, and we have we have other capabilities in other modes. Um, so if you have scope three emissions, which we all do, um, there's an opportunity to start right now. Um, and I think it's important for, for a company like Project 44 to partner with companies like Trax 
to ensure that our mutual customers have best of breed strategies and best of breed solutions to effectively manage their supply chain, whether it be cost, performance, or emissions. Okay, that makes makes totally sense. I uh, have another question, um, maybe for for Jakob. Uh, um, another interesting uh, solutions is to promote the use of eco trucks, uh, biggest vehicles, uh, reducing also congestion and uh, driver shortage. So, do you measure or do you um, model these kind of alternatives, Jakob? Yes, we definitely do. And I totally agree. I just think that the most important thing to this comment is um, I think it's extremely important that we all start measuring before we manage. We've been talking about for five to 10 years, everything should just be electric. Everything should just go on the railroad, everything, but nothing has happened yet. I think there is a, there's a rhythm in measure and then manage and then offset. This is sort of the, the, the way it should go. So I agree with the with the points, but it doesn't make sense if we don't know how much we save on it. So we sit often with finance people who would never ever make a decision if they don't have the numbers, but often they say, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll just buy 15 electric vehicles. And what we say at Trax is we need to measure first and we can measure and we can really quickly come out and get precise uh, data if we use uh, Trax uh, uh, solution together with Project 44, we can really come in and get these very clear measurements. And then we can start looking in and say exactly for this trip, where does it make sense to drive uh, on, on this uh, lane? Where does it make sense to drive electric? Where does it make sense to drive um, uh, with hydrogen and so on and so forth? What is the return of investment? So I agree, but I think we should never ever skip the measurement part because yeah again then we're making strategic decisions with 400 percent error rates yeah and i you know i was i heard a, a, an example it was a cpg manufacturing company a well-known one and they stated you know that uh, a trip i thought i think it was uh Ratzlaff to berlin you know they 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 were not able to do that with uh, uh with eco trucks or electric trucks or whatever you know so they have to offset it in the end otherwise they could couldn't distribute uh, this lane. So, you know, by measure it, you will see the viability to, to, uh, to decarbonize or to offset it, you know? So basically you have to measure it. Otherwise it doesn't make sense, uh, because some areas you are not able to, to, to distribute in a, a, a carbon neutral way. Do you agree, Jacob? Exactly. Exactly. That is exactly the point. It's, um, you, it makes sense to have electric on some routes. It does make sense to have um, to have uh, hydrogen on some routes, but there will be routes where we need to drive diesel yep. and where the method is more getting all the low rolling resistance tires on board we can and get get driver courses, make sure that we drive the clevers. And I totally agree with you. It's it's going to be a mix and we can only optimize if we know what is what is it today and what could it be, so to speak. So again, measure before you manage, but always measure in order to manage. That's sort of that's sort of where tracks tries to go in and 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 be precise. So 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 not just measure and say now everything is fine. No, measure in order to manage, but measure before you manage. All right. Um another question um, can you give some details on the to be determined solutions? What do you recommend? Discuss it with the client? Question mark. Jacob. <laughs> um, we like again. We 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 try always to like right now. We drive two different ways. We do one thing is planning. We do it with the TMS provider, because we as tracks are not uh, experts in. In planning and every company is different and they have opportunities differently and they have another mix of uh, of price sensitivity and, uh, and and time sensitivity so we do it together with the uh, the dis uh, dispatching tool or the tms provider and we just deliver the predictive analytics so that we have this third norm to optimize on that is not just um uh, that is not just uh, service level and price on the other side um we are working right now with different strategies. We do it together with shippers and carriers that we collaboratively go in and say um, uh, which solutions are the best. The, the biggest ones are, of course, uh, eco trucks and find out what is the return of investment if we on this freight lane, uh, this um, on this lane, buy this kind of truck. And 
we also are helping sort of um, to optimize which driver should have which truck. So we have a couple of different projects going on these uh, these uh, uh, sh uh, carrier optimizations, but where the shipper goes in economically and helps um, with with paying the overprice of electric vehicles, for instance. So we have a couple of strategies there. Um, we're very open to go in because, again, we're extremely good at answering questions, but we're not so good yet at asking the questions so if one company comes to us one example is a, a smart uh, a, a fast moving consumer goods company who has the logo on the side of the trucks and who has been working with this carrier for years and years and years they say they're ready to pay for electric vehicles uh, because they'll get they can off ride it in in uh, in their marketing money yeah. on the other side of the market we then have um we then have a um uh, uh yeah other companies who say no we only drive spot market we'll never ever buy electric vehicles but we have other ideas how we can support our subcontractors so we're very like right now the 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 carrier optimization strategies are something we do collaboratively together with the carriers and shippers yeah and, and another example a great example in my opinion is like uh, heineken the brewery uh, from their brewery, the main brewery in the Netherlands, uh, Zoetewoude, they use uh, barges uh, to to export to you know to uh, 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 to transport all their beer to Rotterdam and then exporting into the U.S. as a premium beer, and they use barges and basically they have introduced uh, barges with uh, huge containers and they are you know uh, 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 to make to to exchange. To be more uh, uh, efficient, it's a, a eco barge, so it's a, a electronic driven barge. But it would be great, and I don't know if they are doing it already, to have a, a carbon emission measurement of this transportation mode of uh, electric barges, and to say, okay, you know, uh, what is the, the carbon uh, reduction in this in this phase, and what is the carbon footprint? Is it something also you can? can do Jacob to, to make a measurement of this kind of uh, electronic barge uh, yes. transportation of the beer from uh, the brewery to the, the port of Rotterdam. Yes, definitely. It's something we do and something we really um, uh, enjoy when people take these, um, these uh, uh, initiatives. We're very good at measuring on, on all modes of transport. And, um, and those are often cases. If you buy the green electricity, you of course, uh, um, uh, just, just give me one second. I just need to. I'm getting a little bit interrupted here. I'm sorry. I'll be on in one minute. Okay. Uh, no problem. Um. Um. You know. Uh, next. Uh, uh. We also part of this this uh, example. Uh. Christian. So. Um. How do you start with all this? Yeah. So I mean, one is um, don't wait. Right, so I think Jakob and, and I have offered some insights on on the value of this and how it actually can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so understand, starting today and getting this data, you can start to one have your um, your carbon footprint mapped by mode by geography, and you can really understand what's happening. And two, you can start to make decisions ahead of alternative propulsion vessels or autonomous trucks or, or some of these other things. Mm -hmm. I say that, and it's important because there's pending regulation in the, the EU, the EU carbon border tax. They're starting their transitional period in January 2023, um, and it's uh, going to start requiring companies to pay um, in January 2026. Mm -hmm. That's 75 uh, euros per metric ton of carbon. Now, if a company can't effectively measure how much carbon they have, and they're using those high-level default factors that Jakob and I were talking about earlier, you're potentially overpaying in taxes. Now, if you're accurately measuring, and then you now have a truer cost, um, the true cost of a metric ton of carbon uh, is, I think, still somewhat up for debate. Uh, we have some customers that say it's in the 25 uh, euro range, but they feel that's low. The EU carbon border tax uh, initially says 75 euros per metric ton. Uh, ETS is somewhere in the, the 80 euros per metric ton range. So there's a pretty wide range. Yep. But if we start to contemplate that and then factor that into cost versus performance versus emissions, you could do least emissions routing and understand the trade off in cost and performance. And that enables you to do a few things. One, you can make carrier selection decisions. You could potentially make supplier selection decisions where um, 
no matter what a shipper does, this one supplier, just given with their geographic location, is always going to be dirtier um, than this other supplier. Uh, so that's starting to, uh, you know, get into supplier selection decisions. And then going back to that first Gartner slide you showed on, you know, network design, network design, where do I put my next factory? Where do I put my next distribution center? Um, much of that is uh, based on, um, you know, cost, which is just the absolute cheapest cost to get from A to B. Uh, but if there's not a cost for emissions as yeah. part of a carbon tax, companies will make very, very different decisions. And the companies that start now and get out ahead of that will be better off in terms of cost and they'll be better off in terms of customer experience. All right. It makes sense. Um, uh, Jakob, we'll be back uh, in, in a minute. Um, um, if you go to the, the overall benefit and then we get the, to the Q&A, um, I, I see some more questions uh, uh, coming in right now. So what, are, what do you see as the overall benefits for the sustainability and the decarbonization of uh, the supply chain? Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to start off left to right, um, kind of on the, the softer side on the left and getting all the way up to the more harder cost savings on the right. So um, just making a difference. So, you know, you mentioned Heineken. Heineken has a fantastic uh, corporate sustainability report, Brew a Better World, Reddit. It's great. Um, there will be companies that just want to do good because it's the right thing to do. And they have these net zero uh, initiatives that are driven by what their customers want, driven by what their executives want, or just driven by the fact that they think they can have a positive impact in the world. So that's making a difference. I mentioned it earlier where there are customers that are using those default averages uh, to calculate their, their, their carbon emission, but there's really no way to make meaningful decisions on that. So it's a reduction in manual work. It's very similar to sustainability where there's analysts, emails and spreadsheets trying to cobble together some high level on time performance, but it's very difficult to understand what really happened on a shipment level by hour, by minute. Um, it removes some manual work. Uh, there's going to be a customer experience impact. So customers will want to do business with the companies that most recognize or, you know, that the values are most aligned. So it could be the example of keeping customers, um, retaining customers, attracting new customers, or growing customer share of wallet just because they're comfortable doing business with a company that's doing something better for the world. Then we get out to the right-hand side. You know, there's a potential to uh, reduce transportation procurement costs when you think about what I was talking about earlier with the cost of a metric ton of carbon. Right now, it's really just cost versus performance. What's the cheapest way to get from A to B, what's the fastest way to get from A to B. In the future, um, and it's not so distant future, there's a third direction optimized, which would be what's the cleanest way to get from A to B and understanding the trade-offs in the other two. And then finally, it's just emerging regulations are happening. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in the US, it's happening in China, it's happening in countries around the world, is there is a reporting standard in how you actually report this. You don't want to use those default factors to report out to a government agency especially if there's taxes associated to that. Jakob mentioned earlier how much money you could potentially save just by having better calculations. And that's absolutely important. And that gets into a lot of those other things I mentioned earlier. Uh, cost versus performance versus emissions, strategic network design, supply chain risk management, really, really important. All right. Um, you know, we're getting almost to the end of the, the webinar. Uh, again, we also have a 30 minute off talk right after this. Um, but uh, uh, a few quick questions. Uh, one here, quite in interesting uh, to see. Um, I understand that better data makes a, a better basis on which you can take decisions, but how do you manage to prevent the measure and reporting trap where you do a lot of measuring and reporting, but the act part lags behind? Jacob? Uh, but, but the what part lags behind? Uh, the, act. uh, yeah, the, acti yeah. the acting part. Definitely, yes. I... Um, um, I I think it's a very good question. Of course, I'm 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 um, have been worried about this. And by the way, sorry for the interruption. I had some internet problem that was. Um, but now I'm back in business. <laughs> okay. um, uh, it is true. We've uh, we there is a danger for it. Um, and I do see that uh, the last couple of years, we've seen a couple of tools who say, "Come, you measure CO two." But 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 sort of they stop when you're done measuring. And I think it's it's a matter like. 
I personally hope that it's going to be a competition between companies that they see that it's not enough just to measure. You need to measure and then you need to lower CO2. Um, but uh, of course, I say this because uh, this is what my company is very good at. <laughs> yeah, basically, you already mentioned it. You know, there are some ways to improve it, you know, uh, and then to act upon it, you know. So, um, uh, you know, uh, having food trucks and, uh, you know, other ways to, to go to, to a barge, uh, especially it's all like driven barge and that kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. And I, I think just to just to just to I have always seen it a little bit like product like like um, what what Airbnb did because they did an event to rent out apartments they just made it easier so I think you will see that there are companies like Tracks coming out there and mm -hmm. working together with companies like Project Forty Four actually making it extremely easy not just to measure also to lower CO two and that's I think that's the way forward just making taking away the annoying hustle <laughs> and let people do what they're good at. Uh, and, um, and and become efficient, more efficient. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so there are more questions, but uh, like I mentioned, so we have a uh, thirty minutes after talk. So if you still have uh, questions, and I see some questions already popping in, um, uh, you know, feel free to join us and join us at table one. So we will be uh, right here at in the lounge at table one, and you can talk to Christian, Jakob, and myself. So uh, please join us if you want to. Um, there's more to read. We have uh, created a checklist for advanced supply chain visibility together with uh, Project 34. That's available on our website. Um, Project 44 have uh, a lot of resources. Uh, one of them is a, a white paper of uh, start your supply chain journey to value uh, creation with visibility. That's over there. There's more at, uh, uh, on their website. And of course, Trex has a lot of interesting uh, resources to, to read further about this. Um, and finally, you know, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank you for, for listening in. So uh, thank you for listening in uh, on this uh, very important uh, topic. This has been recorded and this uh, will be made available uh, within 48 hours. So uh, thank you for joining. And uh, hopefully uh, we see you in a lounge right after this, or maybe we see you in another webinar. And with this, I'd like to thank uh, Christian uh, for, for joining us. So Christian, thank you for joining and uh, giving your expertise. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. And uh, of course, I also would like to mention on May 19, we, uh, we uh, Supply Chain Media is organizing our Innovate Supply Chain event. That's a big event on site, on location, but also uh, online. And uh, Project 44 is involved. They will present uh, a lot of keynote uh, from supply chain executives and a lot of startups and scale ups will be there on site, also online. And also Trex will be uh, uh, joining us. So you can uh, join us also uh, physically uh, on our Innovate Supply Chain event uh, on May 19 um, and also online. So make sure that you will uh, uh, will be joining us uh, on May 19 at our Innovate Supply Chain event. And, and we will uh, hope to see you there, uh, hopefully physically. Uh, like I said, Trex and Project 44 will be involved. Um, for now, I thank you for uh, listening in. And uh, I thank you for your questions. And hopefully I will see you right after this. Uh, and please uh, join us in the lounge. And uh, I uh, hope to see you there. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you very much.